All right. Welcome to the Productivity Show, a podcast where we believe that you can get the important things done without having to sacrifice your health, your family, and things that matter to you. Uh, my name is Brooks Duncan from Asian Efficiency, where we help people become more productive at work and in life. And in this episode, I'm super, super excited to welcome Alexis Haselberger, who's a time management coach. And she does, of course, coaching, uh, but also workshops, online courses, all that great stuff. Uh, Alexis, I know you've worked with clients like Google. Lyft, Workday, Capital One, uh, Upwork, which we're big fans of here, and a bunch more. Uh, so we're going to get into all that, but we'll start with something super easy uh, and say, Alexis, how's it going? How are you? Hey, I am great. I mean, I am a longtime listener of this show, so I couldn't be more thrilled to be talking to you today. All right. So this should go really smoothly then. You'll know, you'll know the deal as we go through it. <laughs> Um, so I, I know that you've worked with employees in the corporate environments that I just mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, helping them thrive in those types of stressful environments. That's kind of going to be the through line as we go through today. Uh, but for those listening, uh, even if you don't work in corporate, you know, you don't, you don't need to hit stop. Uh, there's going to be lots of practical and actionable advice for, I think for everybody. Uh, would you agree with that assessment, Alexis? I would agree. A lot of the same issues happen all over the place. <laughs> yes. There's something for everybody here at the Productivity Show. <laughs> uh, all right, Alexis. So since you're a, a listener, you know the deal. This won't be a surprise to you. Uh, when we start every single episode off with what we call our top three resources. So these are three things that are at least tangentially related to productivity, uh, things that are making us more productive or that we're just generally loving these days. Usually it's Tan, Mar Mel, or myself sharing these resources. But whenever we have a guest, we like to hear from, uh, from, from the guest. Uh, so I am going to put the floor over to you. And Alexis, do you have three resources for us? I do. So my first one is Text Expander, which is just a little app that allows you to create snippets of text anywhere on your computer. It fits into your email, into your docs, wherever, and saves you a ton of time. So I probably save at least 10 hours a month just by not writing and rewriting the same things all over again. Um, my next one is Loom, which is just a short video creation tool that works in any browser you're using. They also have a desktop app. And I use this for asynchronous communication with my clients, with my team, et cetera, to help me not write super long emails when I could just instead do a 30 second screen share <laughs> explaining what I'm talking about. Um, and for those of us who are more visual in nature, I think a lot of my clients fall into that bucket. It's a lot easier. And then my third one is going to be the book, How to Change by an economist, Katie Milkman. And this is a book about habits, but from a really research oriented perspective. And so, you know, I've read a lot of books about habits, but this one really stood out to me because it talked about how um, sometimes when we make habits that are less rigid, they're actually stickier. All right. Those are awesome. And uh, you're going to be able to find links to everything we talk about today by going to the show notes. So wherever you're listening to this, you'll see a link there to the show notes. You can just swipe to the right and check it out, or you can go to theproductivityshow.com and uh, the show notes for this episode are going to be right there. So awesome. Uh, yeah, I actually have not read how to change. Uh, and so right after we hit stop on this recording, I'm adding that to my to read list because that sounds really awesome. Uh, and I love your other recommendations as well. Awesome. All right, so let's get into it. And I already gave kind of like a little a little bio at the beginning, but it's always more interesting, frankly, to hear it from uh, from you. Uh, so why don't we start out? Uh, just uh, Alexis, you know, uh, maybe who are you? What do you do? How did you get into what you're doing? Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, would be happy to. So I am a time management and productivity coach. I also dabble in some leadership coaching because it all kind of goes together. And I, I spent the first 15 years or so of my career managing operations, HR, finance, legal, like all the stuff that isn't sales and engineering in startups. And so I was always working in very fast paced environments where there was always just way more to do than people to do it. And it was really important to me to have a life outside of work, which isn't always cohesive with the startup environment. And so I just started to kind of get really into the idea of how do I have more ROI on my own time? And, you know, fast forward 15 years, that's the thing that people were coming to me for. And, the, you know, working at a company, the CEO would say, hey, do you think you could do a productivity workshop for our team? And I said, yeah, that's really fun. 
And then the last startup I went out, you know, I worked for, I went out of business as startups do. And I realized that this was both an area that I get super jazzed about helping people with, and that there seemed to be, you know, lots of people that I've worked with, this stuff doesn't come naturally to them, or they don't know that it's something that they could fix. And so um, there was a pretty good product market fit. And I've been doing that for the last several years. So I do workshops, as you mentioned, coaching, one-on-one coaching, group coaching. And then I also have a couple of online courses. That's awesome. My friends used to call me the angel of death because I used to work for startups too. And it was just like, it was like every time I would join one, it would be dead nine months later. And it happened like three times in a row. So <laughs> I'm very, I'm very familiar with, uh, with your situation that you talked about. <laughs> it's true, right? It's like no company I've ever worked at exists today in the same format that existed yeah. when I was there, if at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, awesome. So one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because of what we were talking about earlier, how you have worked with these kind of like larger companies, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, big, fast moving companies like tech companies, but also more, uh, let's just say less often (laughs) fast moving companies like banks and stuff like that. And I mean, like you said earlier, like no matter what you're doing, you have a lot of these issues that you were talking about. Uh, But I feel like when you're working, quote unquote, in corporate, uh, there's kind of like an added layer of this stuff, like whether it's the pressure to perform uh, a different type of pressure or just like general stress. Like for myself, I've lived this. I worked in a company that was 80 people uh, and then we got bought out by a company that was 35,000 people. And then we merged into a company that was 55,000. And all of those kind of had like different challenges and levels, I guess you would say. Um, So maybe you could talk a little bit about what you've noticed from the people that you work in these kind of like corporate environments that might be a little different than other environments. Yeah. Yeah. So what you've just described, I understand that completely, the getting bought (laughs) out and all of that. Um, So I think that two things come up most often in a corporate environment that are maybe slightly different than, than other environments. And these are meetings, 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 and too many meetings. And then also this kind of perceived expectation that you have to always be on, like that you can never turn, go offline, that you have to respond, you know, within 30 seconds to a Slack message. And I see those things coming up much more frequently in larger corporate environments, just as there's more complexity. And so those, yeah, those are the two things that happen. And I think I have a lot of clients who have come to me and we look at their meetings and their schedules and they'll have like 40 hours worth of recurring meetings every week. And, you know, that's a stress in and of itself because you still have a job to do. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. My wife, uh, she works for uh, one of these types of companies Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I see her a lot more now, you know, after COVID, you know, she's been working from home a lot and I'll be walking by her computer and her outlook calendar will be up and it will be like, a Christmas tree, like completely, completely blanketed, completely lit up. And it's not like a lot of listeners to this, you know, we talk about doing time blocking and uh, like, and uh, planning calendars and all that sort of stuff is like, no, that's none of that. That is like blanketed with recurring meetings and other meetings. You're exactly right. 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 Yeah. And and you're right. Like, it's like, where does the work go? Maybe there's a half an hour in there (laughs) and it's like, well, during that time, you're probably going to be doing email and Slack. Right. So Let's say, so obviously, uh, you know, you're going in there presumably to kind of help people with some of this stuff. Um, So let's say somebody does come to you and they're like, um, hey, I'm just feeling so burnt out. Or maybe uh, I don't know how this happens. Maybe an HR or training department brings you in. I'm not sure exactly how it works. But when people are in these kind of situations, like what are the things you're hearing from them? How do you kind of start helping them address some of this stuff? Yeah. So if we're talking about like the meetings and those types of emergent issues, one thing that I always have people do is just start tracking. And so what I like to tell people is for just a couple of weeks, every time you go to a meeting, if it didn't feel like a great use of your time, just change the color to gray or some other, you know, some other color you don't use on your calendar. It'll be like a secret that only, you know, (laughs) but then you can look back at your meetings and you'll say like, okay, this meeting happens three times a week. And only one out of three times, is it ever valuable to me? Or, you know, I go to this one every week and it's usually not a good use of my time. And so just doing a little bit of tracking can help us to feel more confident about what we actually know in terms of our schedule. So we start there. I also think that when somebody comes to me and they just say like, I'm so overwhelmed, (laughs) like I don't know where to start, which is often the case. One of the first things that we do is just write stuff down. It's as simple as that. Just like start getting it out of your head because like you and me and probably a lot of people that listen to this show, 
we've got task systems that we use, but a lot of people don't, right? A lot of people, they don't have any system at all, or maybe they have 25 different systems. Maybe they have like post-it notes and a, you know, and they're using Asana and they've got a notebook over here and they've got a different notebook over here for meetings. And, you know, it's just all over the place. So one of the first things that I always do is just like, let's brain dump it all out. Let's start having a funnel to get things out of your head and out of all the places and into one place. It's so true what you said about everybody having a system. How do you handle it when somebody, you know, you're talking to somebody and they're like, oh, that's just my system. You know, it, it, uh, they, they feel like it's working well for them. It's, it's their Mm -hmm. system. Like, how do you, uh, it must be hard to kind of like get people to change their behavior or do you even try? Like, how do you handle that situation when people are, people actually feel like they're on top of things, but maybe they're not. Well, I, I would say that most people who hire me don't feel like they're on top of things. Sure. Right? So, sure. <laughs> so there's some kind of bias in there. Um, but sometimes people will say like, this is the way I do it. And then I'm always just asking like, great, what's working about that? Right. What's not working about that? Because I think, you know, nothing works 100% well, right? Mm-hmm. Nothing. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm always tweaking things and I'm always doing, you know, I do a calendar audit, audit maybe every three months just to just to check where things are going. And so I just start by asking questions because I think like a lot of things in life, when we tell people what to do, that's not actually the best path to get, to get them to do something. Um, really you want them to come up with it on their own, right. And them to be the source of a lot of that. And I can help them of course, giving advice and what I think and et cetera. But I think it's often easier to just say like, great, what works about this for you? And then what about X, Y, or Z? Or do you, do you ever miss meetings? Oh, great. How does that, how, how does that, how do you handle that in your system? Right? So I think that if they have a system that they think is working, just asking some questions around what does work and what doesn't can start to help us tweak things. Do you ever have situate, like, I think that's a great tip of going back. And it's, I think not a lot of us uh, do it. And I think many of us could of going back and looking at our calendar and just like you said, like color coding it or making a note or something like that. Um, do you have any strategies for helping people kind of like get out of those meetings that they do find <laughs> that are maybe not a great use of their time? Like, cause a lot of times we might feel that a meeting is like useless or could be sure. better time could be better spent overall, but we feel like we almost have to go. Um, whether that is true or not is a different story. Uh, how do you kind of like take people through that journey? Yeah. So I think that using language of experimentation is just a lot easier than language of change, right? So let's just say you're at a meeting that's only useful to you once out of every month, right? But you're in it weekly. Being able to go and say like, hey, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm wondering if we might experiment with making this a once a month meeting instead of an every week meeting. Would you be open to trying that and then coming back in you know, August and seeing if that worked better or if it didn't work as well? I find that most people are willing to experiment or at least they won't be willing to say that they aren't willing to experiment, right? Whether they're feeling that internal resistance or not, but most people are pretty resistant to change. And so if you can bring it in as uh, something that could help everyone and that isn't a permanent change, I think that is really much, It's more likely to get a good reaction from other people. I love that. So you're not saying, hey, let's change this meeting to monthly instead of weekly. You're saying, hey, why don't we do a little experiment and just Mm -hmm. see how it goes? And, you know, if it doesn't work after one or two times, we can switch it back. Exactly. Yep. Oh, that's awesome. Um, One thing that a lot of people think is that, or maybe you can answer this, a lot of these companies have like HR departments, training departments, you know, all that sort of stuff. Are they generally supportive of bringing you in or are people generally like on their own, um, either themselves or getting a group or something like that? Are people on their own bringing you in? Like how, how does that uh, kind of situation work? So it happens in both ways, but I think that HR teams, like they often don't have a lot of budget right? It's really hard for them to advocate for the budget that they need. And a lot of these skills are hard to measure, right? And so I think a lot of times it's, it's just hard to get the budget that they want for, for these types of things. I would say a lot of times 
an individual manager will reach out to me and be like, I need help with this for my team. And so then, you know, I have a situation where I'm working with a quite large company right now. And on the regular, I have different managers from that company emailing me saying, Hey, I heard about X, Y, or Z that you did for this team. Could you do that for my team too? Right. right. And so it's kind of a bottom up approach in some ways. Um, and then I think, you know, you would be surprised. I think like some companies I've worked with are fantastic with their training programs and they're really polling their teams to find out what the skills needed are and, and bringing in that stuff. And others, it's just much more kind of disorganized in, in some ways or the, you know, the kind of the bigger it gets. It's like either they're trying to do something at scale that works, you know, as a, as a very kind of low, low cost per person kind of a thing, or they're trying to kind of blanket it, which when you blanket statement anything, it doesn't really work that well for people. Yeah. It, and it's, it's interesting. Like I've been on both sides of this, of the ones like trying to bring people in, but also like being kind of like taken from a training company. And I feel like, or not taken from a training company. I mean, um, like HR or training is like sending us somewhere. And I find that those bottom ones, bottom up ones are the ones that are way more effective anyway, versus, uh, versus just having a program that everybody's kind of like going through the motions to do because they're uh, burning budget or whatever. <laughs> Right. Because yeah, it's like, you want to give people the training they want, not the training that's like somebody else thinks they need. Right. So I have kind of a, I don't know if it's controversial or, or it's something that I personally have struggled with, which is a lot of the productivity advice you get out there and, and we're as like into it as, as much as anybody, you know, we talk about on the podcast and the blog and stuff like that is that, um, you know, the things you, you know, a lot of times people say, you know, step one, like make sure what you're doing is aligning with your values or start, you know, find your why and kind of like work from there, or maybe it's, you know, work on your big, hairy audacious goals or your overarching goals and a lot of people like we say that and people are like nodding like yeah of course I got to be aligned with my values or whatever but sometimes like people will kind of whisper or say or you can kind of like tell it tell it by the vibe that you get from people they don't actually know what their values necessarily are or should be, or they feel like it should be like, mm -hmm. oh, I should be changing the world or something like that. <laughs> you know, this is what all these books are saying, you know, right. um, how do you, first of all, do you, do you kind of like take people through the journey of trying to like align what they're doing with their values or goals or whatever? Uh, mm -hmm. and if you do, like, how do you, how do you, uh, get that out of them if they're not really sure? Yeah, this is a great question. And I, I feel similar to you. I talk about this too. And also it seems a little fluffy sometimes, right? You're like not exactly sure how actionable it is. But what I do, what I would do with people is, so, you know, sometimes people come in and they're very clear and other times people just feel stressed and overwhelmed and overworked and they're not really clear. And I always, no matter what, start with some time tracking just for a week, just tracking everything you're doing all day long with the goal of being able to answer some questions at the end of it. So being able to say like, okay, when you look at this data, what do you wanna be doing more of? Or what felt like you were doing too much of it? Or what were you really surprised by? Or when were you most stressed during this week? And I often find that by looking at data first and then trying to elicit the kind of the feelings and the, the things out of that, then, you know, maybe they're not going to come up with their set of personal values, right? <laughs> but they're going to be able to say, okay, yeah, I am doing too much of this and I want to do less of this. So now let's talk about some actionable strategies to make that happen. And I find that that's more valuable than having, it's kind of like, you know, the difference between culture in terms of like our corporate values versus what we actually do, right? Right. And sometimes our corporate values are like higher up there than what we're actually doing on the ground. And, and so I think that's how I, that's how I typically approach it. I like that because I feel like a lot of times people are like, Hey man, you know, shooting for my big goals or values or whatever. I'm just, I just want to get my head above water. <laughs> like that's, that's where I'm at right now. I just want to be able to go home at a, a, a reasonable time or, you know, not be on my laptop all night uh, after I put the kids to bed or something like mm -hmm. that. Uh, and so I like that approach of finding out, uh, kind of framing it like this is what you want to be doing versus this is what you are doing. And, you know, how, how do we get there? I, I like that a lot. 
Right. Yeah. And it's like, if you come to it with just your big hairy goals, well, there's still a lot of minutia of life that has to be done. Right. And so, you know, sometimes you hear that just have three things on your list every day and it's like, well, okay, but also, you know, we might need to call the, you know, the plumber and the whatever. And so I think it's, it's hard to match those when we get that advice of like, oh, just do the most important thing all the time. Cause there's a lot of other less important things that still have to get done. Maybe we can get like a little uh, tactical. Um, when you say you're helping uh, get people doing time tracking, for example, mm-hmm. is it like you're sitting there with an app or they're sitting there with an app like toggle where they're like starting and stopping and tracking every minute they do? Is it more high level? Like, hey, you did about a half an hour of this, about an hour of that. Like, how do you, how are you actually doing that time tracking? Yeah. So I give people various methods to choose from because not every brain works the same. And so I definitely have some clients who want to use toggle. They're like, you know, very into it. They want to get it all set up and they don't need tech help from me to do it. Right. They're just like, I'm an app person. I also have a spreadsheet that just has a pivot table in it that will, you know, calculate up. You just put start time, end time and category, and it kind of calculates it all up for you. And then some people are like, just, I'm like, just put a piece of paper next to you. Right. Mm -hmm. And then as you're going through your day, write down, you know, like 7am woke up 730 kids woke up 8am breakfast, whatever it is at the transition points. Um, and, and that works well for them. And then for some people I'm like, okay, if you can't do that, you know, sometimes I work with a lot of people who have like ADHD and, and it's just hard to remember. I'm like, okay, let's just do a couple of self-reflection questions at the end of the day. Right. So I really try to meet people where they are with that. The goal never being that we have perfect data and always being that we want to know what your insights were when you had a higher awareness of your time. I love that. Well, especially since you mentioned pivot tables, so you you definitely got me there, but (laughs) yeah, (laughs) it's true. Like, I think I'm not, uh, I think time tracking is super, super valuable, but I do think, or I do suspect that a lot of people who do like the super granular time tracking are maybe spending a little too much time on the tracking part and a little and not quite as much as the doing the stuff that they need to be doing part. Uh, so I love that you're able to just be flexible and uh, figure out what's going to work for each of those people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think if it's taking more than 10 minutes a day to time track, then we should look at, you know, look at what we're doing. So I'm assuming when you're working with, uh, you know, you've worked with a lot of people, I'm sure there's like some red flag, not red flags, but some, some, common phrases and words that kind of come up as you're, as you're working from people, uh, like some of them, you know, like, I don't have time. I'm just too busy all the time. Maybe I'm like drained at the end of the day. And at least from our perspective, what we see is a lot of people feel like, uh, that's a time management problem. Like they need, they need, uh, I don't know, to figure out their calendar or they need to do time tracking, like you said. And sometimes that is absolutely the truth, the truth, but other times there's kind of like other stuff going on there. Um, how do you kind of figure out based on what they're saying and then kind of taking them through it, what the actual problem is? Yeah. I mean, I think this is a really good question, right? Because everybody says I don't have enough time and (laughs) I, you know, I'm stressed, et cetera, everybody that I work with at least. And, and I also think that's just true of all of us. Like none of us have enough time, right? I mean, we, some of us are, are better than others at prioritizing the things that matter to us. And then others are just feeling like a constant onslaught of all of these things. And so when I work with people around those, like one shift I like to make is it just around language. So it's not that I didn't have time for something. It's that I didn't prioritize that thing, right? Because those are actually very different. One puts you in the point of agency where you are controlling how things are going. And the other one is a kind of receiving or reactive, like all of this stuff is just happening to me and I don't have any control over it. So one just like mindset shift thing that we start doing is like talking about prioritization instead of about the time that exists or doesn't exist. In terms of, you know, how do I how do I kind of pinpoint what each person needs? I actually have a pretty, I have a pretty defined arc that I take everybody through. And sometimes we are spending a lot more time in one area than another. And sometimes one area is just like, oh, yep, you're doing that stuff already. Great. We don't need to focus so much there. Right. So sometimes people have a lot of trouble with focus and getting, you know, trying to remove distractions might be something that we, we really need to handle because 
it's not about, you know, they have the time on their calendar. It's <laughs> just, they're getting distracted all day long. Right. Um, so that's how I, I work. it. I, I found that there's kind of eight areas where most people that, that kind of, if you can master those areas, then you're doing pretty good with your personal productivity, your systems and how you feel about your time. And so I just take people through those and we spend the amount of time on each one that, that we need to. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but do what you the have the, the eight areas? <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you kind of left that softball there. I can't resist swinging for it. <laughs> okay, great. I am totally happy to share. Sometimes I get into too much detail. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, we start with just kind of self-awareness and knowing yourself better exactly as you are. So there are a number of different kind of traits and tendencies that I've identified in my work with people have something to do with how we get things done and knowing who we are. I'll, you know, an example is I am a night person. I've always been a night person waking up is the hardest thing I have to do during the day. And it has been since I was five years old, I am never going to be part of the 5.00 AM club, right? It's just better to know that about myself and work around it than it is to try to force me to be a morning person, right? There are a number of things like that. We also start with the time tracking. Then we move into task management. So we're figuring out what that system is going to be for them or tweaking their current systems. Then we move into prioritization. So the tasks are the what, and the prioritizations are really the when. Like, when is this stuff going to get done? And what should we say no to? What should we should say yes to? Then we move into planning. So, you know, short-term planning, daily, weekly, and also the more bigger, longer-term, quarterly, et cetera, big life goals. Uh, then we move into um, our calendar and our tools. So, you know, our calendar, document management, just kind of like all of those tech tools that we use on a daily basis for personal and for work. Then we move into habit building because a lot of this stuff is about habit building. And so we want to use science back, back techniques to help us to achieve the habits that we're looking for, because I don't know about you, but willpower and motivation just aren't enough right, to make that happen. Um, then we move into efficiency. Uh, so we're, we're saying, okay, so you do have a certain amount of time that you want to be working. How do we make that the most valuable time for you? How do we avoid time wasters? How do we batch process, templatize, you know, um, outsource, delegate, all that stuff? And then finally, we move into focus, which I think is equal parts removing distractions. And then also, I mean, you tell me, have you been alone in a room, no distractions, no kids around, still can't focus? Yes, absolutely. Right? It happened today. <laughs> right, exactly. And so we, we go into techniques that we can use um, for that as well. So that's kind of the arc I take everyone through with the goal that at the end of this, they will have a, a set of personalized productivity strategies that work well for them and that they'll have kind of a backpack full of tools so that if, you know, when things change again, which they will, they'll be able to know, you know, which tools that they can whip out to be able to rejigger their systems. Love that. So that's really awesome. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. I want to I want to dive into one particular area, which is prioritization, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, that kind of like triggered a thought for me, which is in corporate, this can be a really, really kind of difficult and stressful problem because a lot of times you have stuff that you need to do from your customers, you have stuff from your boss and or your boss's boss, you might have dotted line relationships where you technically work for this person, but you report into this other person, maybe even in a different time zone, different area of the world. Um, and it can be really, really difficult to prioritize what you should be spending your time on in any given day. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have some tips for how to like figure that stuff out, at least to a certain extent? Yeah. So I, I always think about prioritization as uh, from the perspective of when am I going to do the thing? So I don't really use kind of like high, medium, low, or, you know, all the, all of those things we think of when we think of prioritization, I really think of like, okay, when do I need to do this next action to meet the deadline that I've committed to? Right. And so for when I, when I work with people on this, first, we start with like getting clear expectations and clear deadlines, clear prior, you know, whatever you can get from other people about what they're asking from you, that becomes really important because I think that is a huge source of stress for people in corporate is that they're asked to do something with not enough context, right? So they're saying some, even, and even when people say like urgent or back burner, these are not, that's not enough, right? Because Urgent might mean, oh, within the next week, or it might mean like this afternoon. And if we don't have that data, then we don't know how to prioritize. So first step is like, every time somebody's asking you to do something, get super clear on when they need it by, right? 
I like to use um, what I call the magic words, which are, does that timing work for you? <laughs> so okay. if somebody says, Hey, can you do X, Y, or Z for me? Tell them some time. Like if you think you can get it done by Wednesday, tell them Friday, right? Be like, great. I can get that to you by Friday. Does that timing work for you? Most of the time they'll say, yeah, no problem. And now you've given yourself a little bit of leeway for when things go south, right? Every once in a while, they'll say like, no, it's for the board meeting tomorrow, right? And then now you have that information so you can better prioritize and move things around if you need to. I also think using your calendar is a really helpful thing. So using time blocking, as we talked a little bit about, but also like time block, like when you commit to something, putting those time blocks on your calendar, even if they're not gonna be at the exact time, just so that when you look at your calendar in the future, you're not looking at something as blank, you're saying, oh, I have already committed to a bunch of things in here. So maybe I can't commit to this other thing. Cause I think we're always doing things with the best of intentions. We're just not always looking at what actually is on our plate. Cause we've forgotten what we've already committed to. I love that question. Does that timing work for you? I think that general concept can be so valuable uh, incorporated in anything because a lot of times we, we are reacting to or assuming um, we're assuming limitations and attitudes that aren't necessarily there. Like we're, we're sitting there frustrated because we're rushing to do something, but it doesn't actually need to be rushed. Mm -hmm. uh, or the, on the flip side, we're not rushing something that needs to be rushed, but it's never been explicitly talked to. So okay. both sides kind of have assumptions, but no one's ever actually <laughs> clarified those assumptions. So I, I love that just being the one to ask the question. Uh, you might not like the answer, but at least then you'll know, <laughs> right. which is way better. <laughs> right. Then you'll know, and then you can kind of shift things around and you can do it the other way too, which which is, you know, when you're asking someone for something, be mindful to say like, hey, I would love if you could do this by you know, X date. Does that timing work for you? Right. <laughs> Which then allows the other person to say, mm, I've got a couple of deadlines I'm working on or yeah, no problem or whatever it is. That also gives you information. If it's not going to work for them, maybe there's another person that, that you could ask, right? Or maybe you can help them shift um, some priorities to make this work. So I think it works in both directions. So other than the things we've kind of talked about, like meetings, prioritization, time management, are there any other kind of challenges or common themes that you've helped people with that you see a lot of, of people you're, you're working with? Like anything kind of like come to mind as, as something that's, uh, that's kind of um, stands out? Yeah. I mean, I think that the biggest thing that people come, like the biggest overarching thing is that people feel a real lack of control. Like that, that's, if I could sum it down to all of these things, it's like, I don't have enough time. It's that people have a real lack of control or they, they have a sense that they have a lack of control. And I think that a lot of this comes from just not actually knowing what's on your plate, like not really like fully getting it all out there. And then also from all these, you know, the one thread of all these things that we're talking about, right. Is that making the implicit explicit, right. When you have a task system and you can take, and you're feeling overworked and overwhelmed, and you can take that to your boss and say, this is what I've prioritized. This is what's on the back burner. Do, are those, do those priorities sound right to you? That is so much, it's just such an easier conversation than I'm so overwhelmed, I'm probably gonna quit or, or whatever, you know, wherever we go there. And so I think that a lot of times helping people to realize that like, they can be the person that makes something explicit. They can be the, you know, very recently I had a client who's a product manager and we were looking at his calendar and he just felt like, oh, my, you know, all the, the, my clients, they can just book time with me at any old time they want to. And he was using Calendly, which is, you know, a calendar <laughs> scheduling tool. So I said, well, and Calendly, like, you can control that. And he's like, yeah, but I got to leave it open. And it, Anyways, I was like, why don't you just try it? Why don't we just try for a couple of weeks and see what if you gave your clients only access to half of your schedule? What would happen then, right? And he did it and he was like, nobody cared, right? <laughs> they were all happy about it. Um, and so I think that just a lot of times being willing to put yourself out there, to be willing to experiment helps you to bring back that feeling of control. Wow, that's amazing. The, uh, yeah, that's like, I never thought of this, but that is like the superpower of Calendly. It's not just, it's not just leaving or Calendly or tools like it. It's not right. just leaving spots open on your calendar, or it's not just letting people find those open spots. It's controlling <laughs> when they can find those open spots. And that's like the, the, the next level thing that really unlocks the power. So yeah, I love that. That's yeah. amazing. 
Now, a lot of times people don't really have a choice which tools they use. You know, they, they're an Outlook, uh, Outlook shop, they're a Google shop, they are maybe not able to install or access other tools. But do you have like favorite apps or tools to help people if they are wanting to track their tasks or be on top of this stuff? Do you have, do you have any kind of like favorites you point them to uh, when you can? Yeah, definitely. So I would say I've probably reviewed 50 different task apps over the course of, you know, I don't know, however long we've had apps, the last 10 years or 15 years. And the one that I come back to over and over again that I recommend most frequently is called TickTick, T-I-C-K, T-I-C-K. Not to be confused with TikTok, which we all know is not a productivity tool, or at least not in my case, right? Um, but TickTick. And the reason that I like this app is that one, barrier for entry is very low. So you don't have to like fill in a million fields. You can use it in a lot of different ways flexibly. So it doesn't take a lot of learning. There's not a high learning curve to use it. Lots of my clients who are not tech savvy at all have pretty much no trouble using this tool. The free version is great. It syncs on every device. So it's like whether you're on, you know, you could be a mix of Android and Apple and it's on your computer and it's on, you know, your phone and all of this. No problem, it's syncing everywhere. And the mobile experience is just as good as the web experience, which I find is not the case for so many different apps. So um, so that's my favorite one. That's the one I recommend most frequently. All right, tick tick. Yeah, we'll make sure to have a link to that in the show notes. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, all right. So we always like to wrap up these episodes with something actionable, like we something that people can take away and do. So number one would be maybe check out TickTick. <laughs> but um, other than that, uh, if you were to have somebody implement like one productivity practice or just take some sort of action, uh, what what would that be? Turn off email notifications. <laughs> Just as simple as that, I think, oh, and Slack, right? Like whatever the notifications that you have on that are not particularly that useful. And I'm going to say email notifications. Nobody relies on email in an emergency, right? Um, turn off the notifications. Because if you think about the stats that every time we get distracted or interrupted, it's about 23 minutes for us to refocus on what we were doing. And we think about how many times we get dinged and pinged all day long just turning off the notifications will give you a sense of calm and ease and you'll be probably more responsive than you were when you were just constantly ignoring all of those notifications. I love that you said that because just the other day, and I wish I could remember who it was that said it, but I read somebody uh, who said this, which I thought was very true, is these notifications are not there to help you in your productivity. These notifications are there to get you to use the product more. <laughs> so <laughs> once you kind of have that mental reframe, it's like, yeah, turn those things off. It's not helping you. It's helping the company. Uh, so yeah, turn those things off and get your, get your sanity back. I love that. All right, Alexis, this was super amazing. Thank you so much uh, for being here. I, I learned a lot personally. Um, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, if they have questions, if they want to learn more about the stuff that you do, um, where are the best places uh, online to go and uh, get in touch with you? Yeah, the best places are my website, alexishasselberger.com. Uh, I'm at, on YouTube, do more stress less. Facebook, do more stress less. And also Instagram, do dot more dot stress dot less. <laughs> A lot of do more stress less there. That's awesome. Uh, okay, great. So like we said earlier, we'll have links to all of those. We'll have links to TickTick. We'll have links to the top three resources. Uh, everything we talked about, you can go to theproductivityshow.com and the show notes will be right there or they should be there wherever you're listening to this in your podcast app as well. So thank you again, Alexis. And thanks for listening. And we will see you next Productive Monday. <laughs>